Good evening. I'm Karen Taylor, Program Director of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York. And I'm delighted to welcome you all here this evening, uh, both in person and indeed our online audience. Tonight's program is presented in partnership with the New York Landmarks Conservancy, and I would like to express our appreciation to them for their promotional assistance for this talk. Uh, for those of you who may be less familiar with the General Society, a brief introduction. The General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York was founded in 1785. 237 years ago. Today, our organization, a nonprofit, continues to serve and improve the quality of life of the people of the city of New York through our educational and cultural programs, including our tuition free mechanics institutes, um, the General Society Library, of course, of which you're in this evening. And uh, finally, um, well, not quite finally our Mechanics Institute, our tuition-free Mechanics Institute, and a very warm welcome to some of our students who are attending here this evening. And finally, the John M. Mossman Lock Museum, uh, which those in-person attendees are very welcome to go and visit after the talk this evening. For our online audience, please free, feel free to submit type questions at any point during the presentation through the Q&A section, and of course, at the conclusion of the talk. We would ask that you use the Q&A section rather than raise your hand. For our in-person audience, we ask that you keep your questions until the end of the presentation. It is such a great pleasure this evening to introduce to you Professor Richard Hall. The talk about John Roebling and uh, Professor Hall's new book, Engineering America, The Life and Times of John A. Roebling. And I just happen to have a copy of this magnificent volume and it is for sale tonight. And Suzanne at the back of the room will be happy to uh, sell you a copy. And of course, I think Pre Professor Hall would be delighted to, uh, to sign it for you. Um, it's also available online through the Oxford University Press website. Richard Hoare, originally from Leeds in England, is a professor of interdisciplinary studies at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, CUNY. He's also the author of The Brooklyn Bridge, A Cultural History, and The Art of Brooklyn Bridge, A Visual History. What a huge pleasure it is to introduce to you, Professor Hoare. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, and thank you to Karen for inviting me. Thank you to the General Library, uh, General Society for hosting me here. Um, I started working on this book in 2005 and I've worked on it on and off until about 2020. And uh, the book was due to come out, or it did come out in May, 2020. Um, just as everyone had stopped buying books and not going out and I had all these sort of events lined up to talk about the bridge, uh, talk about the book, and they all got canceled. Uh, and I've done some Zoom talks since then, uh, which have been uh, fun, uh, but I haven't actually spoken in front of an actual live audience about the book uh, and talk tonight. Uh, so this is sort of like, thank you. This is, you, you are my coming out party, uh, or the book's coming out party. Um, so thank you um, all for coming and thank you everyone online. Uh, it's slightly strange to have a camera there, um, but thank you all for coming. Thank you for saying hopefully um, uh, you all enjoy the talk. Um, and so I'll start with the question I get asked all the time or the most question is why? Why John Roebling? Why would you spend so much of your professional life uh, researching this guy? Um, and the answer, as always, as always happens with Roebling, comes through the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, so I've long been interested in the Brooklyn Bridge. I was interested in Brooklyn Bridge as a symbol, as a subject in art, as a subject in all sorts of uh, cultural practices. Um, and when someone 
creates or when such an icon exists, I think you often think, who designed this? Who came up with this? I think um, it's a sort of interesting question about what happens with all these icons. Uh, where do they come from? Um, and the answer seemed sort of from a distance to be quite fascinating. He was an immigrant who founded a sort of seemingly utopian farming community in Western Pennsylvania. He was a social critic. Um, he was industrialist. He was an engineer. Um, he was an inventor. He was a musician. He was even a sort of dietary theorist in some, in some regards. Um, he seemed um, like a really fascinating person. Um, and he also seemed to be quite brilliant at half the things he did and really quite crap at the other half of the things that he did. Um, and this made me a little bit suspicious. Um, and I also thought as a historian, nobody had done any fresh research on him in years, um, which is always a red flag to historians if no one's done any, any work on someone in years. Um, and I will say that this is actually the first biography of John Roebling to be published since 1945. And so there's been a huge gap in people thinking about him and doing research on him. And if you just think about the amount of sort of cult, like personal stuff that gets unearthed in as we go along, what we knew about John Roebling in 1945 versus what has been archived and found now, there's like this huge amount of new material. And I think that um, certainly this book is based on traveling all around uh, this country and doing a lot of fresh material and relying on a lot of really interesting material that's been found in Germany in recent years, um, which I'll talk about during the talk. Um, so um, when I was thinking about this, John Roebling seemed like a very two-dimensional person. Uh, he was a flawless engineer and a very flawed human being. Uh, and this is what stood out to me, this contradiction. Roebling could wrestle thousands of tons of wood, granite, and iron into beautiful and intricate monuments to humanity's capacity for energy and vision, uh, combining advanced mathematics and physics with the eye of an artist and a master craftsman. As an engineer, he was a genius and a visionary. Yet he also believed in spirits. He also wrapped himself in a wet sheet before going to bed at night, practicing the, uh, the water cure. Uh, he attended seances, avoided eating loads of different types of fruits and vegetables. He kept a list of things that he thought were poisonous, um, including most fruits and vegetables. Um, he believed that the judicious application of water to the skin um, could draw out bad humors and poisons. Uh, as a human being, and specifically as a sort of doctor, uh, he was a crackpot that was sort of open to all sorts of fads and things like that. Um, so it seemed like this really um, odd human being. Um, and this is another, another one of our images of him. Uh, he doesn't look like a, he looked like a bit of a crackpot in the image, I think. Um, so I suppose what I was thinking was how could someone be so right and so wrong at the same time? Uh, such a genius and so bonkers, uh, and all within the realm of what we would call science, broadly speaking. Um, and if he had all these contradictions in his life in that regard, uh, what, did, what did the rest of his life look like? Um, and so I tried to make some sense of it, if I could. Um, so what did I find? Who was John Roebling? Um, and this is a slightly, this is actually the only portrait painted of him. Uh, it's a little softer than the last image. Um, I think the main thing I want to say about John Roebling is that most of the things we know about him uh, are wrong, uh, even the good things. Uh, he was certainly a great engineer, but he was not without his blind spots. He was not a flawless engineer by any means. Um, and the things he's most famous for, the wire rope business and the Brooklyn Bridge were actually brought to their full glory by his sons, not by, not by him. Um, the bad stuff is also too simplistic. Uh, it often fails to account for the context of the times John lived in, um, and also relies too heavily on a lot of gossip and hearsay, um, and not to mention uh, the sort of a memoir that his son wrote uh, late in life, often about 30 or 40 years after the events he describes, um, which has guided and informed a lot of people's views on John. Uh, the account written by his son is simultaneously deeply unflattering, but also deeply unreliable. Um, so I think that it's, uh, I think we all know that none of us would really want our children to write our biographies. Um, and so um, these are sort of things we should bear in mind when we take them perhaps too seriously. Um, so what I'm going to do um, for tonight is to sort of uh, try and tell you a little bit about John's life um, as an engineer and as a, and as a human being. 
Uh, I'm going to start by sort of sketching out his life in the broad outlines. Um, so uh, they can be traced quite quickly. Uh, John was born and raised in the town of Mulhausen, uh, the German town of Mulhausen during the Napoleonic Wars uh, in 1806. And this is um, an image of Mulhausen uh, that actually John drew when he was 19 years old. Um, this was, uh, he had a cousin in Mulhausen. This is Mulhausen. Uh, he did it in, uh, this image is from 1825. Uh, he had a cousin uh, who had a print shop in town and um, he printed this up into a, a sort of lithograph and sold it locally. Uh, it also gives you a good sense of that John was a pretty good artist as well. Um, when he was uh, 18, John left Mulhausen uh, to attend the Prussian Building Academy in Berlin, where he became interested in suspension bridges. Um, this is a drawing from his notebooks uh, of the Hammersmith suspension bridge, which was built uh, across the River Thames in London in 1825. Um, this is also drawn from uh, a textbook uh, that he had seen. He did not, he never traveled to London. He never saw this bridge in person. Um, uh, and so this is an uh, example of when he's starting to get interested in suspension bridges, learning about them at the uh, Prussian Building Academy. Uh, and in one of those happy incidents of history, uh, he also took a course of lectures with the great philosopher G.W.F. Hegel, helping spur a lifelong interest in philosophy and philosophical matters. Uh, a year after college, he headed off to Arnsberg in Westphalia to work as a civil engineer. He stayed for three years. Part of his degree was he had to get some practical experience. He was supposed to go away for a year, but he stayed for three years. Nobody knows quite why, um, but he did stay for three years. Uh, gaining an excellent education in all aspects of practical engineering. A lot of engineers in the 19th century got their training on the job rather than actually going to a university, uh, especially in America, but also on to some degree in the continent in the US. Um, and while he was out in um, Westphalia, he actually designed, while he was doing this practical engineering, he actually designed um, two suspension bridges uh, while out there and submitted them to, for, comp com for competition. He didn't get either of the commissions. Um, one of those, the designs for it, uh, were recently found about 15 years ago in an archive in Germany. Uh, the other, the designs have been lost, but the, res res the response from the Prussian Building Academy uh, survived. So we know he designed these two things. Um, the most extraordinary thing about this is that John designed two suspension bridges before he'd ever seen a suspension bridge in person. Um, he, he studied about suspension bridges in Berlin. There was no suspension bridges in Berlin. Um, and he designed these two bridges in, 19, in 1829, 1828, um, and he first saw his first suspension bridge, uh, which I'll talk about a bit later, in 1830. Um, and the, ones, the one uh, plan that survives from the archive in Germany, uh, a couple of architects in Germany sort of went over it and did a computer model of it, and they said, actually, it's a pretty good design. It would, it would stay it up. Um, so um, even with his very first designs, uh, he knew something uh, impressive. He was, he was able to design a functioning suspension bridge. Um, John never actually returned to Berlin and never finished his engineering degree, meaning he only ever had a single year of university. Um, he returned to Mulhausen in 1828 and soon met a guy called John Etzler, and together they discussed emigration. Uh, Etzler uh, is still someone who's still talked about a little bit um, in, uh, by historians. Uh, in 1830, so about four or five years after he met John and came up to the US, he published this book, uh, The Paradise Within the Reach of All Men Without Labor by Powers of Nature and Machinery. Um, it's the first book, it was, this book is famous in some ways, it was reviewed quite lengthily by Henry David Thoreau, um, but it's also the first book uh, to advocate uh, solar wave and wind power. Um, and so it's created, created a reputation. Etzler is sort of thought of one of the first green energy pioneers. Um, Together, the two Johns founded the Mulhausen Emigration Society and set off for the US in 1831 in hopes of establishing a communal farming settlement. But the two fell out on the way there. The whole Emigration Society fell out on the way there. And when they landed in Philadelphia, they all split off and went their separate ways. Um, John, um, John started with this huge Emigration Society and after about three days in Pennsylvania, had him and his brother and uh, a couple of indentured servants and no one else to start his new, new life with. Um, John adapted well to his new country, except in one regard, slavery. Uh, Roebling was a vociferous critic of the South throughout his life and held a profound repulsion for the practice of enslavement. Um, 
It is neither lying nor dissembling to say that slavery is the greatest cancerous affliction from which the United States are suffering, Roebling wrote after a few weeks in the country. In 1831, which makes him quite, um, uh, quite unique really, uh, slavery contrasts too greatly with the rest of their political and civic institutions. The Republic is branded by it and the entire folk with its idealistic and pure, altogether purely reasonable constitution stands branded by it before the eyes of the entire civilized world. Uh, a few days later, Roebling read about a group of enslaved people in New Orleans who had managed to get hold of some weapons and were planning an uprising. The example of Haiti is too great a provocation for the slaves, Roebling wrote. Such, see such scenes and horrors will and must occur as long as slavery continues to exist and as long as whites will not listen to reason. Sooner or later, the blacks will revolt just as long as they are suppressed and robbed of their human rights. I wish them all luck. It took a mere five days for an unusually smart and articulate slave by the name of Nat Turner uh, to make Roebling look clairvoyant after he orchestrated a slave revolt that killed over 60 white Americans. Shunning the South, John made his way out to Western Pennsylvania and bought 1,600 acres of land in Butler County where he founded the village of Saxonburg. And this is uh, our the first, um, the only real image of Saxonburg uh, in its sort of infancy. Um, I think I can do this. this ah, there we go. See, that's where Roebling lived. Um, and that's actually where his uh, wife's family lived down there. But there's a whole, um, uh, everyone is named down here where they live. Uh, behind these houses running along is Main Street. And then everyone, his house goes along like that. And you have the, the sort of way down the back there would be your sort of garden area or pasture area. Um, this is when when John starts his wire rope company, he, uh, he starts spinning wire ropes in the meadow down behind his uh, house down there. Um, what you also see here again is this, um, uh, it's, it, it was an image that was sent back to Mulhausen um, uh, and printed up by his uh, cousin and printed in Germany. Um, it was used as a sort of promotional device uh, to lure people over. John had built the, bought all this land, he needed to sell it to somebody, he needed people to come over um, and take it off his hands. So it was, he tried very hard to sort of sell the idea of Saxonburg in Mulhausen and get new emigrants to come over. Um, uh, the area that he settled in was good in some regards, it had plenty of Germans uh, and had access to Pittsburgh, it's very close to Pittsburgh, um, and it had plenty of Germans in the area and plenty more to come. That area became heavily um, populated by Germans as the 19th century went on. Uh, but it was poor in others, it was not good farming land, and John intended to become a farmer, but over sev many, several painful years, he realized he was terrible at it. Uh, and slowly he returned to engineering, working on the Pennsylvania Mainline Canal and conducting railroad surveys for the state. Uh, by the end of the 1830s, he was basically working again as a full-time engineer. Uh, in 1841, he hit on the idea of making rope out of spiraled wire a notion that made his fortune and helped change the landscape of his adopted country. Inclined planes were just taking off in the USA and were used to drag people and raw materials, mainly coal, up and down mountains. And this is an image of um, an inclined plane. Um, you see the rolling stock uh, would go up and down. It was an endless wire rope powered by a steam generator, a steam power generator, and it would bring the rolling stock up a mountain as it would uh, lower the, um, the other rolling stock down. Uh, so you could bring coal oil or people, in the case of the Me Pennsylvania Mainline Canal, um, they tried to do what the Erie Canal did, but they've got the Allegheny Mountains right in the middle. Uh, so they would get people up and down and over the Allegheny Mountains, not with a canal, because you couldn't, but with um, a portage railroad, which is based on this inclined plane idea. Um, uh, these, uh, in, in, these inclined planes, Use, use traditional hemp ropes, which were costly and rarely lasted much more than a single season. Rope made from spiral wire lasted much longer and was adaptable to many different uses. Uh, rigging, derricks, cranes, um, inclined planes themselves were the forerunners to uh, funiculars, cable car systems, and eventually uh, elevators. You see, you see here's another uh, example of that. Um, all of which exploded onto the American landscape in the mid to late 19th century and all of which was supplied by John A. Roebling's son's company, 
who are the largest single manufacturer of wire rope in the USA well into the 20th century. Roving ropes pulled elevators up and down new tall buildings, making possible thousand foot high skyscrapers in New York and Chicago. Held up suspension bridges of prodigious length from the Hudson River to the Golden Gate, drove mass transit cable car systems in thousands of towns and cities all over the US. All of this and more flowed from the industry John set up in his backyard in the, 19, in the 1840s. Um, John's wire rope business liberated him to become something more than a working engineer, something much more like a gentleman engineer. Engineering wasn't what put food on the Roebling table. Um, if it had been, John's career would have looked very, very different. Um, his manufacturing interests allowed him to pick and choose what projects he undertook. Uh, and with an income secured, John devoted much of the rest of his professional life to building suspension bridges. In nearby Pittsburgh, he built the Allegheny Aqueduct in 1844, his first ever bridge, um, and the Monongahara Suspension Bridge in 1845, um, which is the first true suspension bridge that he built. This is an image from the, a photograph of that from the late 19th century. Um, in between 1848 and 1852, he built four suspension aqueducts in upstate New York for the Delaware and Hudson Canal Company. Uh, this is the longest of them at uh, Lackawaxen, um, suspension bridges are a really excellent way of getting one body of water over another body of water. If you need to get a canal over a river, uh, you can see, I think, uh, there are canal boats. This is a canal that comes around and is carried over the river. Um, this bridge here um, is, uh, has now been refitted. It was, it was, it was uh, came, uh, end of the 19th century, it stopped being used for canal, uh, canals and was recently retrofitted for cars. So the same sort of flume system exists, uh, but for cars, and that's what it is now. Uh, this is uh, the, De the Delaware Aqueduct Bridge uh, at Lackawax, and it's the oldest suspension bridge uh, in the US. And it's still there, and it's not very far away, you can go visit it. Um, John's great triumphs as a suspension bridge engineer, the Niagara Falls International Suspension Bridge, um, which you see here, uh, which was built over the Niag Niagara River between the USA and British Canada um, in uh, 1855. It's the first and really the only fully functional railroad suspension bridge. Um, and you can see there the railroad going across. Um, this is about um, two and a half miles north of, the Ni of Niagara Falls. Um, uh, the next bridge he built, were, well, he also built the Covington and Cincinnati suspension bridge, um, which was the longest bridge in the world uh, between Ohio and Kentucky. And it was the first, it was, this was opened in 1860. Uh, seven, and it was the first structure built between the North and the South after the Civil War. Um, in between, he built the St. Clair Street Bridge in Pittsburgh, uh, which is a slightly more modest bridge. Um, and he was at work on what would have been his masterpiece, the Brooklyn Bridge, when he was felled by a tragic accident. Uh, this is uh, the first ever uh, rendition of the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, this was done in 18, the first visual rendition of John's sort of vision for the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, it was done in 1867. Um, William Hildebrand, who was an assistant of John's uh, and, and John Roebling worked on it. Um, and it was the, the vision that accompanied his proposal to build the Brooklyn Bridge. He, built, he worked on a big proposal and accompanied it with an image that, you know, this is what I'm gonna build and this is what it's gonna look like. Uh, so this is the first real envisioning of what the Brooklyn Bridge would look like. Um, John, of course, is best known as a suspension bridge engineer. And it's his bridges that have made him famous and rightly, rightly slow. so. And his impact on the development of the suspension bridge is relatively easy to state. At the beginning of the 19th century, most suspension bridges fall down, or at least suffer frequent significant damage. At the end of the 19th century, most of them don't. Um, John is a key figure in this history. Um, suspension bridges are a balancing act. This is actually the first modern suspension bridge uh, or rendition of it ever built. Um, in 1801 in Western Pennsylvania by a man called James Finley. Um, suspension bridges are a balancing act. Uh, the towers have to support the cables um, and the cables have to support the roadway via the hangers. Uh, the roadway and the cables need, whoops, oh, page mixed up. Uh, need to be flexible enough to account for movement but rigid and heavy enough to resist vibration and wind. When the countervailing forces in a suspension bridge don't countervail, you have a problem. 
And this happens most often when you have either high winds or rust. High winds acting on a floor that is too flexible creates torsion and twisting, which tends to amplify itself until it becomes dangerous. Unless you try to mitigate it in this case, or in the case of suspension bridges, uh, creating a rigid roadway by means of some stiffening truss running the length of the bridge, which is a problem John obsessed over and worked on for years, um, but which wasn't fully realized in the engineering community until uh, the 20th century, really. Uh, and the, the case of the Tacoma Narrows uh, disaster, which uh, many of you may know, um, this, uh, this was uh, Tacoma Narrows Bridge just south of, of Seattle in Washington State, uh, over, Tacoma, over Tacoma Narrows River or Narrow Inlet, um, when you see that this is, there's no stiffening truss or no ability to create a stiffening deck. And once it starts to move, um, it sort of twists itself apart. Um, this was a very famous bridge disaster. Um, this is, uh, I think no one died, so that guy got off. Um, um, but um, it's, it's, it was a problem in suspension bridges for a very long time. Um, it was also what happened, uh, to go back to the 19th century, uh, what happened to the Wheeling Bridge over the Ohio River uh, only a few years after it was opened in 1849. The momentum created by its own dead weight when forced into motion by heavy winds wrecked its own destruction. And this is um, an image of the Wheeling Bridge uh, just after it was opened. The Wheeling Bridge still exists, those towers still exist in Wheeling uh, over the Ohio, but uh, all, the, the, all the cable networks and the roadway has been replaced over the years. I think it's actually even just closed off right now, it's been completely unsafe, uh, but those towers still exist. Um, and two things that's interesting here is um, that come into play is um, what is called the Garland system of suspension cables, which is favored by French engineers. Um, and, uh, and this is, was built into the design of the Wheeling Bridge. Uh, John favored binding them all together and then wrapping them, which is what you see in suspension bridges nowadays. Um, it was not a settled question at the time. Uh, John advocated for it. Um, and wrapped and bound cables are now standard. Uh, what's also important, which comes into play in a little while, is uh, how these uh, cables are sort of clamped up to the top uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the towers, uh, a problem John wrestled with as well, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, this bridge, the Wheeling Bridge, was designed by Charles Ellett. Um, it was the longest suspension bridge in the world at the time. Uh, and Ellett's reputation was, at the time, much greater than John's. Um, until a massive gale swept through the Ohio Valley uh, in 1845 and arrived in Wheeling. The whole of Ellett's Bridge began heaving and dashing with tremendous force, reported the local paper. For a few moments, we watched it with breathless anxiety, lounging like a ship in a storm. At one time, it, the bridge's floor rose to nearly the height of the tower, then fell and twisted and writhed and was dashed almost bottom upward. Down went the immense structure with its dizzy height, the stream below, with an appalling crash and roar. Nearly the entire structure struck the water at the same instant, dashing up an unbroken column of foam across the river to the height of at least 40 feet. The destruction of Alex Bridge was more or less total. All the cables on the north side, except two were ripped from the towers. All the cables on the south side were torn from their anchorage while the entire woodwork was, quote, shivered to atoms, which is a phrase that perfectly describes what also happened to Ellett's reputation. Um, by contrast, John opened his Niagara Falls suspension bridge uh, the following year, which not only resisted the frequent gales that plagued the Niagara Peninsula, but also carried fully loaded trains across it. Um, and I remember, I, every time I look at this, I think what must have been going through the train operator's mind um, the first day they tested this, uh, that is so far up, uh, and there's a train operator with this fully loaded train going, all right, and here we go. Um, let's see if it holds up. Um, um, few better uh, illustrations, uh, few better examples illustrate um, the fate of the two engineers. Ellett never built another bridge while John went on to build the Covington Cincinnati Bridge, which was the longest in the world and get the contract for the Brooklyn Bridge. It was John who pioneered the use of inclined stays, which you see most remarkably on the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, 
um, who a pioneer the use of inclined stays both above and beneath the bridge uh, and tried to incorporate elements of a stiffening truss into his roadways. Um, if you look at this bridge here, uh, the trains go along uh, on the top and below that is, um, is the carriageway for horse and carriages. And you can see John built this to be a box structure, to add rigidity, to provide strength, uh, so it wouldn't be too flexible, uh, to provide a truss-like system. Um, it was Roebling who obsessed so much over rigidity and stiffness and built them into as many elements of his bridges as he could. Uh, this is the plan uh, for the Monongahala suspension bridge, which is the second bridge he built. Uh, and you see again, trying to create a, a stiff uh, truss-like system to create stability in the roadway. Um, thankfully, no one died during the Wheeling Bridge disaster, but plenty did in the 19th century. The deadliest suspension bridge disaster in history took place in Angers, France in 1850 uh, on this bridge here. Um, the whole event was almost scripted to illustrate all the things that could possibly go wrong with suspension bridges. On April the 16th, 1850, several hundred soldiers were marching over the bridge in high winds. The soldiers were under strict instructions to break step, but the gale was strong and the bridge began to sway and move and then bang. One of the main suspension cables came loose and the whole thing, bridge and soldiers and all were pitched into the river below. And to make matters worse, the soldiers had been ordered to march with bayonets fixed, meaning that those who survived the fall to the river then had to somehow dodge a whole bunch of falling knives. 223 people died. This is an image of the bridge after the collapse. Uh, the problem wasn't just the gale, but that other enemy of suspension bridges, rust. The heart of a suspension bridge is its suspension cables, which need to be firmly anchored on either shore. But if water and air can get into the anchorages and nobody notices, rust forms, compri compromising the strength of the cables, which is what happened in France. The gales and the soldiers didn't bring down the roadway, but it did put extra pressure on the anchors, which had significant rust damage, rust damage and they gave way. Uh, John understood that suspension ca cables are elastic. They move, they expand and contract thanks to changes in the temperature and to account for the traffic that travels from one end of a suspension bridge to the other. And also that if their movement is impeded at any point, then stress weakens the structure. Many early suspension bridges, for example, and as we saw in the Wheeling Bridge case, um, fixed the cables to the towers meaning that movement is curtailed and the cables pull on the towers, creating stress. Um, and this is actually, this is the Bamberg Bridge, um, which is the first suspension bridge John ever saw in person. Uh, and what you see here is the uh, suspension cables are fixed in towers like that, uh, which means that they have no, they're fixed on one side and fixed on the other side, they have no room to expand and contract. Uh, or if they do, they're going to pull on the towers. Um, and move them either way, creating stress fractures. Um, um, John understood this uh, instinctively. He made notes about when he first visited this bridge uh, before he'd ever built one, he made notes in his notebook uh, saying that this is a bad idea. Uh, the, the cables need to go over the, over the towers, not, not be fixed into them. Um, and he developed uh, roller bearings or saddles for his bridge bridges. Um, this is the, uh, the Brooklyn Bridge where a saddle is placed on top of the towers and the cables can go over. Um, and saddles, of course, became a standard feature on suspension bridges. Um, but this observation is, is, is very long-sighted in one way, but short-sighted in, in another, uh, leading to one of the ways in which John, uh, one of the most important things John got wrong about suspension bridges. Um, if cables move along the whole length of a bridge, then that process starts at the ends. Cables are typically attached at either end of a suspension bridge to a large metal anchor plate, which is held in place by great masses of stone and cement. Nowadays, anchorages are kept open so rust can be spotted, but John didn't grasp this. He sealed up his anchorages with stone and cement, creating what he called a solid envelope. Such a process was intended to anchor his cables and also to prevent air and water penetrating down to the place where the cables met the anchor plates. 
But if cables can pull on a stone tower and create fissures over time, they can do the same to a sealed anchorage. Sooner or later, the same thermal and vibratory forces acting on the cables above ground would also play out in the anchorages, tugging on John's solid envelope, slowly loosening the cables from their cement casing. If this is a cable and it's anchored into the ground like that in cement, when you pull on it and pull on it, it gets looser and looser um, and create a sort of a pocket there. And once those tiny cracks are formed, gravity would do the rest. Uh, allowing moisture to trickle down at the anchorages and collect near the cable ends. This was potentially disastrous when coupled with the overall scheme. In an open anchorage, the cables can be inspected and repainted and repaired. In a closed anchorages, there's no way to tell what was happening to the anchors, the very things that are holding the whole bridge, bridge up. Uh, you just can't look what's down there, so you have no idea what damage is being done. Uh, this is actually what happened in most of John's bridges, uh, and it was a serious flaw. Quietly unearthed in the case of John's Niagara Bridge by a team of engineers in 1877. Uh, the whole anchorages had to be dug up and, re, 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 and, and all the cables uh, repaired and the whole anchorage sealed up again. Um, subsequently, the anchorages were almost entirely rebuilt um, and the Niagara Bridge as they were for his St. Clair Street Bridge in Pittsburgh, where the same problem was discovered in 1883. And, the, and John's Covington and Cincinnati Bridge during an extensive renovation of the span in the 1890s. Um, the same problem did not plague the Brooklyn Bridge for the same simple reason that John didn't build it, didn't build it, his son Washington did. And he, uh, rather than John, needed, understood the need to create open anchorages. So the Brooklyn Bridge has never had this problem because the anchorages are open, you can inspect the cables. Um, one way in which um, his son got things, or learned from his father's mistakes and, and changed things. Um, John, of course, designed the Brooklyn Bridge uh, and left all these drawings and all these plans for his son, but his son designed, built the Brooklyn Bridge and had to make significant changes as he went along. Um, um, a question uh, that rarely gets asked of John or most other engineers is what he thought he was doing. Um, and this is, an, this is an image of, this is John here in the tan coat. And this is a whole bunch of other engineers. This is on the Clifton or upper suspension bridge at Niagara uh, in a sort of fact finding mission, but this is a whole bunch of engineers. Um, nowadays in our times of extreme specialization, we think about civil engineers as closed off from broader social questions, selling their skills in metallurgy and mechanics to whoever has a requisite financing. This wasn't always the case. 19th century engineers often saw themselves as addressing what you might call the problems of civilization rather than simply the problems of physics. And they wrote not just about specific problems they faced in their work, but about the impact they hoped it would have on the world. They had vigorous debates about education, about municipal politics, urban problems, and other issues. We are quite used to thinking of artists, writers, politicians, as intellectuals, but not so with engineers. The very people who planned and created the built environment in which all that thinking got done and about which much of that thinking evolved, revolved. Such a man was John Roblin. John wasn't just an engineer. He thought about how engineering might affect the world. He was a deep reader of philosophy and an engaged social critic. He was a man who saw connections between things, between technology and society, between building things and building a better world. He believed that the endlessly repeatable forms of modern technology could bring about a more perfect union. And I'll just summarize very quickly two examples I use in my book. Um, and I'm just gonna show you this. This is uh, some of John's uh, writing. This is his handwriting. Um, one thing that's important to, to know about John Robing is he wrote all the time. Uh, he's got his, his, his papers, copious notebooks full of writings, um, all sorts of things. And his, pri his private papers are huge, uh, copious and voluminous. Uh, and it's not just technical works, but notebooks, uh, but literally thousands and thousands of pages of thoughts about society, about the state of the world, about philosophy, you name it. Um, and they are really are the key to understanding him, I think. Um, this is, and to give you a sense of the size of these papers, uh, this is the first page of a, a manuscript called The Truth of Nature. And it's literally, it's one of dozens 
that he wrote in his life. Uh, this, The Truth of Nature is 1,502 pages long. Um, and it's just one of the few things, one of the many things he wrote. Um, he did just as a, as a bit of a background, he did a lot of writing during the Civil War when much, most civil engineering projects were sort of at a standstill um, and he had a lot of time, more time on his hands uh, where he wrote uh, an awful lot about society, especially about the Civil War um, and about the United States in general. Um, John believed that uh, engineers could harness the resources of the natural world to create a more equal society. As he wrote in 1862, as comforts increase and become more plentiful, more within the reach of every human being, in the same ratio, social distinctions will be leveled down and common fellow feeling will be cultivated. It is the great mission of science to abolish slavery and to establish perfect freedom in its stead, which consists of perfect emancipation from natural as well as spiritual bonds. The church refuses to assist, Therefore, science is left alone. Later in the same essay, with the vast power of physical nature under our control, the day will come when in consequence of a general diffusion of all the essential comforts and even luxuries, the now almighty dollar will have lost its charm and will have lost its controlling power. He didn't get that right. Um, then and not until then will man be prepared to inaugurate another era in the history of his race. John styled this, um, uh, did I? that's, oh, no, that's, yeah. Um, sorry. John styled this the era of redemption in which technology would lead to a profound moral adjustment. Human selfishness and exclusiveness will abate and the true freedom of the mind shall be achieved. Man's sympathies will be enlarged. The human family will become one fast brotherhood and the weak, as well as the strong, will be embraced. Um, to use more specific examples, John was a vocal proponent of both the Transcontinental Railroad and the Atlantic Cable as works of profound social connection and unity. Uh, John, as well as being an engineer and industrial and an inventor, was often a sort of public intellectual of some description. He spoke in front of places like the Pittsburgh Board of Trade. This is from 1846. Um, and talked about um, changes going on in the world and new technologies. Um, Railroads and telegraphs, John wrote, may be hailed as the latest offspring in the spirit of the present age. They have imparted a new and most powerful impulse to the social movement from which will yet flow a vast train of beneficial results. And if anyone was wondering how exactly this would happen, John was happy to clarify. One of the best proofs of the advancement of mankind in true civilization is that the industrial efforts of a nation are no longer squandered upon the creation of vast amounts of pride and of war. Like a magic wand, they instead open the slumbering resources and long hidden treasures of the earth. Drawn into bonds of union and amity, isolated individuals, as well as communities and nations, unchained, unchained long cherished prejudices and selfishness and cause to be made more simultaneous exertions in all that is useful and good. Railroads and telegraphs were the nurse of modern civilization. They would band people together, heal divisions, make neighbors out of rivals and free people out of the enslaved. Engineers saw railroads and telegraphs along with suspension bridges and other great works of connection as great works of technology and of moral advance as physical things embodying functional design and philosophical principles. John and others of his ilk were engineers through and through, but we might also describe them as practical philosophers. They saw a future made of iron and steel, molded by engineers into a world of unity and equality. Uh, this, perhaps more than any other reason, is why I called my book Engineering America. Um, I'm gonna close now with just a few thoughts on John Roebling as a human being. Um, as, a, as I mentioned earlier, I thought John was a genius when I started uh, this project, and I also thought he was a bit of a weirdo. Uh, John believed in spirits and attended seances, wrapped himself up in a wet sheet before going to bed. Um, and so this, this is, the, the water cure was very popular in the 19th century. 
um, ate charcoal on a daily basis, treated himself with cold running water when he had tetanus, thought he could ward off cholera by pacing him down, repeating, I have it not, I have it not. He believed in odic force, which I will, I don't, I simply don't have the patience to explain to you, but you can Google it. It's crazy. Uh, he believed that space was a substance um, and that the afterlife consisted of seven spheres of existence that you slowly work through to get to the final state, Summerland, which sounds pretty cool. I, would, I don't think I would mind ending up in Summerland, um, but I don't know that I believe there are seven spheres of existence after you die. Um, but I don't think of him as a weirdo now, even though much of what he believed we would now call mumbo jumbo. I've learned, I think, the first lesson of biography, that we need to take people on their own terms, not on ours. The 19th century was an age of invention, belief, and exploration. People believed they could find answers to almost anything, John more so than most. He was at heart an ideas man. He had thousands over the course of his life. Most missed the mark in one form or another, but some didn't. And those ideas helped change the face of a nation. His views on medicine, for example, may strike us as misguided and delusional, but the medical profession had barely entered its, in, entered its infancy by the mid 19th century. To one degree or another, almost all ideas about medicine were wrong. The doctor attending John's brush with cholera blamed the disease, for example, on the epidemic constitution of the air. Instead, John's life outside of engineering showcased the society's struggle to reconcile the rising influence of science with the declining authority of faith and religion. Beliefs were in flux. New knowledge was created at a bewildering pace, much of which refused to sit easily next to established ideas. A surprisingly large number of prominent Americans, judges, military officers, politicians, businessmen, for example, took to spiritualism precisely because of this. In a climate of change and creation, new things seemed possible and within reach. New ways to build, communicate, and think. New places, materials, and laws to discover, perhaps even talking to the dead. In this, the 19th century was a time of optimism, but also of huge loss. War, disease, and large-scale migration separated family members, often forever, as it did with John, who lost a beloved child in infancy, had a son fight in the Civil War, and never saw either of his parents again after um, leaving Europe when he was 24. The confluence of discovery and loss fed the spiritualist movement, which in turn reflected the age in which it appeared. The religious impulse represents, if the religious impulse represents the search for answers in the face of profound grief, then spiritualism offered a comforting, plausible solution to a bewildering era that took away as much as it promised. Spiritualism sought to bring science into the world of faith, to make the afterlife a verified observable fact. We might scoff at a nation as taken with seances as hard science, but it's entirely possible that during John's life, more people believed in spirits than in suspension bridges. John, of course, believed in both. John was a seeker, a believer, and a scientist. He belonged to the blurred line that ran straight through the 19th century, shaping its unsteady but inexorable march. John helps us understand and remember that the achievements of industry and engineering, what we take to be the triumphs of applied reason, are often created by people with a decidedly different perspective on the world than our own. He is also a reminder that people can be many things and that contradictions aren't always as clear as with hindsight. Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, literature's most rational brain, was a doctor, ophthalmologist, and botanist who studied at one of the UK's most prestigious medical schools. He was also a full-throated advocate of vaccinations. He also believed in fairies. John's achievements in applied science stand in somewhat stark contrast to his ideas about other branches of the natural arts. But his failings in this regard don't, aren't his alone. They belong to the times, just as his successes do. One might also say they weren't even failings at all. We think of people like John Roebling as embodying great contradictions, but they are only contradictions to us. They weren't contradictions to him or to the others of his era. 
Instead, they were the creaks and groans of a culture working things out, moving itself forward in time and in understanding, trying its messy best to incorporate new aims and new ideas into an existing order. In this, John Roebling was a near perfect reflection of his time. He was a seeker and a believer, an ideas man. He was the 19th century writ large. Thank you very much. Richard, that was the most fantastic presentation. You, the, the most fantastic? Yes. Thank you. You, you illuminated a complex man. Um, and it was, you know, it, it really, it was, um, it was ter terrific to find out. Also to answer your question, why he was an engineer. I had absolutely no idea. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are now going to take um, some questions, uh, both from our online audience and our in-person audience. And I think we have, I have one question. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to start off here. And could you all wait until the mic um, comes to you? Thank you. Uh, did, Don, did John have any audience for those writings that you showed or were any of them published while he was alive? And if so, who was the Very audience? Very few. Okay. Um, that, that is actually a really good question. Um, he wrote a few short essays, like he wrote one for, called, for the consideration of the US president, but he had no, he didn't make any attempt to send it to Abraham Lincoln. Um, and uh, so I, I don't really know. Um, he did publish things over his life, mainly on technical matters, um, but there is no indication that he wrote, he wrote these big track. So I, maybe he was thinking about publishing them at some time. He met an untimely death. Um, he died. Uh, he did not die of old age. So uh, he may have had some plan for that. But there's no indication of that. They, they're written as if they are books. Um, but I don't believe he made too many. I, I couldn't find any evidence that he contacted a publisher or um, made any efforts in those regards. He wrote letters to the editors of papers a lot about a lot of different things. He wrote on universities, on, he wrote um, uh, a, a long article about the need for like a, a national university of practical mechanics um, that he thought should be in DC and things like that. So he did publish things over the course of his life, quite a few things really. Um, but the private papers, um, I don't know what the aim was, um, but I, th I think that John's biggest audience was often himself. Um, and so he, um, and one of the things I didn't really touch on, um, but is really important for understanding him, he's, he's desperately trying to create order out of everything. Anything that's a chaos or not in line is, is, seems to be an affront to him. And so I think what he's trying to do is put his thoughts into, about the world, set them straight. So he knows what he thinks about them. So, you know, we, we do this when we want to understand what we're thinking about things, we, we write them out. Uh, so I think partly he was writing for himself um, and maybe he was thinking about publishing a, a book at some point on philosophical matters. Um, he wrote a lot during the Civil War and then towards the end of the Civil War, the Cincinnati Bridge that he was working on, which had been sort of postponed when the war broke out, uh, was back on. So he was suddenly back into building the Cincinnati Bridge um, and uh, he got the contract for the Brooklyn Bridge about sort of the, one of the most fortuitous bits of history is um, uh, in um, 1867, the East River froze over uh, between New York and Brooklyn. And it was literally three weeks after he had just opened the biggest suspension bridge in the world in Cincinnati. So as soon as that froze over, New York was on, on the phone. There isn't any phones there, but um, to John to say like, we need, a, we need a suspension bridge, get on this. Uh, and so he, he rolled from project to project. As soon as Civil War ended, he rolled from project to project and then uh, met his end at the beginning of the building of the Brooklyn Bridge. So what he was planning to do after that, I don't know, but it's a very good question. And I don't, I don't really know the answer. Uh, right, I'm gonna take an online question and then I'll come to you, sir. 
Um, what was Washington's opinion of his father? And did Emily write about her father-in-law? This is from Rena online. This is a complex question. So Washington Roebling wrote a memoir of his father, um, which he began in 1896, I think, and then finished about like 1907. Uh, and it was sort of uh, a biography of his father, a memoir of his father. Um, so it was um, so 30 years after his father had passed away, and most of the events are about 50 years uh, before then. And it's incredibly um, unflattering. Um, it's, it's really, it's, uh, and he describes him as a sort of this tyrant, bloodthirsty, whipping all his children into, uh, it's really, really unpleasant, actually. Um, and it's, 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 some parts of it are true and some parts of it aren't true, I think. There's, there's a number of things that he describes in the book that if you look at letters between Washington and John at the time, is not what went on. And so there are examples where you can prove it's demonstrably false. Um, now, why does, why does Washington do this? Um, I think that poor old Washington was sort of forced to live in his father's shadow for large periods of his life. Um, he was, he, he, I don't know if he wanted to become a suspension bridge engineer, but he never had any choice. He was sent to Rensselaer, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Um, and he um, was sort of forced to follow in his father's footsteps. Um, and he uh, felt clearly a huge obligation to finish the Brooklyn Bridge when his father passed away. Um, and building that bridge sort of broke him on some level. He, he con contracted the Benz twice and was reduced to a wheelchair. Um, the, the building the Brooklyn Bridge took a huge toll on Washington. And at the end of it all, everyone still think, thought John built it anyway. Um, and so he spent, he sort of broke his life and his body on this bridge. Uh, and then he would meet people afterward and they were like, oh, you're rubbing. If you see your dad, tell him I love his bridge. Um, and Washington Black like, built that. Um, so uh, I think that uh, he lived in his father's shadow for vast periods of his life and then continued to do so after his father passed away. So I think he was just pissed off um, and sort of a uh, thing, but it's uh, I th the one thing about father and sons that I think is most frustrating for a biographer is as with, with lots of close relationships, most of that relationship took place behind closed doors. Uh, there's no, there's, there are some letters, but aren't too many. But they lived, they, did, they worked on projects together, they spent a lot of time together. And those conversations that they had in the home, on the bridge site, in the factory, all those things, they're sort of lost. And they're really, they would, they would tell us a lot more about, their, their relationship by letter was quite formal. Um, Washington wrote this memoir at the end of his life, which is deeply unpleasant and just doesn't stack up against what, um, he says that he treated his children really badly and beat them. But there's lots of letters from his children to John saying, hey, daddy, how you doing? Can't wait to see you to come home. And so it seems like an odd note uh, in all this. Um, and, you know, I think no, no one else seemed to have a bad word to say about John. And so as a historian, when one person says something awful about someone, but nobody else does, you have to sort of say, well, maybe there's other reasons here uh, for why that is. You can't take everyone on their word. You've got to look at the larger picture, I think. Um, Emily um, didn't write um, very much. Emily, a lot of Emily's papers were destroyed. Um, and I don't think she's had much to say about uh, John. John was overjoyed when he found out that they were getting married, even though he hadn't met Emily. Um, and he wrote this wonderful letter to, to Washington saying, oh, I can't, I'm so happy uh, for you. I'm sure she's a wonderful woman. If you ever need some money, you don't need a job and anything like this. Um, and so, um, I don't know if this fully answers your question, um, but um, actually it's not your question, it's your question, isn't it? Um, but um, there's this one discord note, which is Washington's memoir of his father, um, but most of the rest of them, and their letters to each other are, are really quite nice uh, and lovely. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's what I've got. Right, well, actually I'm going to ask a follow-up question okay. to that. Was Roebling's reputation diminished after Washington's book, or did the bridges speak for themselves? Um, well, Washington um, 
Yes and no. So Washington's memoir was unpublished. Uh, it was sat in the archives for years. It was published recently, um, about maybe 10 years ago. Um, and what people think about it or no, but it, it was certainly people who did work on the robings went to the archive and they knew this thing existed and they read through it. Um, so it certainly has, John's reputation is as, and the, the photographs of him don't do him any, any favors really. He's thought to be very stern and very um, uh, humorless and, uh, and much of that comes out of books like David Steinman's book, which was published in 1945, that portrays him as a very stern genius. Um, and so, um, again, this is one of the reasons I got into the project in the first place is it just, I was wondering if there was more to this, um, if there's more to this than the thing. And I, I never met John, uh, but he seems, um, he seems uh, to have been a man of varied interests um, and um, who, had a very benevolent view of mankind and uh, humankind. Uh, so I, I, I think I come down in a very different way than most uh, roving biographers in thinking of him as being uh, a less aggressive, a less stern um, person. He never seemed to have a, a, a bad word to say about anyone in his letters. And I read, I mean, countless amounts of uh, pages. Um, and so I don't, I don't think of him as, um, as I, I, I don't recognize um, Washington's John Roebling when I read through the archives. Um, and, I, and I have a whole section in the book about comparing these, uh, these two figures. Another reason to get the book. Yes, absolutely. In reviewing his extensive writing, uh, did you come across any explanations uh, of uh, possible refusals on his part to accept projects? And if so, were the reasons political, technical, or Sorry. financial, or whatever? Um, no, his papers are, um, he was interested in building as many suspension bridges as he could. Um, and so his papers are actually full of, if you sent him a letter saying, hey, I'm thinking about building a bridge over this creek, he would get back to you and he would probably come up with an initial design. His papers, um, half his papers are at Rutgers University Library, um, which is a sort of family papers and all his engineering work is up at, at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And it's full and full of these wonderful engineering drawings of loads of unrealized projects. Uh, he designed bridges all the time. He worked on them all the time. And he, um, he, did, uh, he designed all sorts of bridges, uh, but as with everything in the 19th century, these are all sort of private projects. So if you couldn't get the financing, um, often uh, projects got, um, got um, put aside. The most famous case of that in terms of John is the Kentucky River Bridge, which he got as far as building the towers for, um, but they ran out of money. Uh, and it was gonna be another railroad suspension bridge after the Niagara, it started before the Niagara and then stretched on after the Niagara Bridge. Um, but he would have, John would have built as many bridges as you could. I don't think, I don't know, any instance of him turning anything down. Um, he even drew up a plan for a suspension bridge over the St. Lawrence Seaway at Montreal, which would have been really, really long. Um, but he built, um, he designed all sorts of things. He had a, one of his most interesting is um, a project called the tri Tripartite Bridge. Uh, he drew up a plan, if you can imagine the confluence of the Ohio, the Allegheny and the Monongahala at, at Pittsburgh where the point is, uh, he, had, he, was, he was going to design a bridge that went out from the point of Pittsburgh uh, into the middle of the Ohio and then branched. It was a Y bridge. So there'd be a suspension bridge that would go, uh, so sort of three suspension bridges that would go in a Y shape. Uh, and that was in 1846. He was always thinking about these things um, and always coming up with ideas. Um, and he, his, his papers are full of dozens and dozens of unrealized projects. Um, and some of them, like the Kentucky River Bridge, they just didn't have any money. And so they got the towers built, but, uh, and he was, he, he spent a long time trying to make that still work. He even bought, he even bought some stock in the company, uh, but it never got there. Right, we'll just take a couple more questions. And I will take here and there. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, uh, Professor Hall. Thank you. That was that was great. I had a, it. really. Um, I had a question. Did, did he write in English or German? And and why were all these Germans emigrating <laughs> to America in 1828? I mean, or 1836. Um, lots lots of reasons. Um, he wrote. Uh, he he spoke. His na his native language was German. He also learned and wrote uh, and spoke French and English. Um, he thought that it was really important uh, if you were gonna to move to a country that you learn the language of that country. Um, and he, he had a lot of thoughts about what Germans should do when they got to the US. And he had, a, he had actually, what he really wanted actually was for Germans to learn English. And then in places like Pennsylvania or Ohio, for the Americans to learn German, because there's plenty of Germans there as well. And he, he actually, he wrote a piece uh, early on in arriving in America advocating for sort of dual language newspapers and say that, again, like if the Germans speak English and the English people or Americans, whatever, um, spoke German, you'd communicate better uh, and you'd get along better. There wouldn't be those divides. Um, and so, but he, he wrote, his business was in English. Uh, the business of the US uh, at the time was in English. And he wrote for, um, he wrote for um, publications uh, the American Railroad Journal and things like that which were published in English. So uh, English was the currency and he became uh, I mean, obviously fluent, uh, fluent in it. Um, in terms of Germans, um, there, are, there used to be more people with German heritage in the US than anyone else, uh, especially at that time. Um, German, um, one thing, the great time of German migration to the US starts in 1830 which is when John came over. Um, and from 1830 onwards, thousands and thousands and thousands of people are fleeing, sort of German speaking. There is no Germany at the time. Germany is 1871. Um, but the sort of the situation in, one reason John came over was all sorts of things, but John had grown up in the Napoleonic Wars, which is complete chaos. Um, and then you have the sort of French revolutions of 1830 and everyone in Europe is like, here it comes again. Um, more chaos and destruction. And a lot of people start to move out. Um, part of the sort of backlash against the Napoleonic Wars in continental Europe was to sort of, um, uh, was to get rid of all these ideas about freedom. Like, let's not have any more of this French Revolution malarkey trying to get everyone to think about freedom and liberty and all this stuff. So the, the, a lot of the regimes in Europe and especially around German speaking, it became very repressive. Um, and it's, you know, people are feeling that they're getting spied on all the time. Um, there is, uh, and people just start to move uh, for the first time all throughout Europe. Um, and once, uh, and America's this sort of shining beacon. Most of them get here and go, oh, I think I've been lied to. It's not quite as easy as I could. Um, and there's some famous uh, Gottfried Duden, I think, um, is was very famous German writer who emigrated to the US in 1820 and just wrote this book um, about what it was like. And it was just this paradise. It was so, it's such BS. Uh, but it was hugely popular in Germany. And people were like, wow, I can own my own farm. It, and he was saying like, all it takes is an hour in the morning to cultivate your crops and everything, the taxes are so low here and there's no crime. And there's no, and like one point it's like, there's no, there's, there's no wild animals, there's no anything. And like, uh, you don't need to worry about, at uh, one point, it's so funny. You don't need to worry about wolves eating your sheep. There are wolves around, but they don't eat sheep here. Um, and they're like, nah. Um, and this, these, this became like a huge seller in Germany. And it just, I mean, America's had this, effect on people it's a magnet it's people's image of it has you know it's, it's often seen like this beacon like it's freer over there it's easier over there there's more land over there there's always sort of things same in Italy and all sorts of places so um John is really the very first of a huge wave of German uh, emigration um in the 19th century and in places like Texas Wisconsin Ohio Pennsylvania all these areas huge German populations over there um it's really, it's really, the 19th century is really, a, we tend to think of various different ethnic groups coming to the US, but the biggest group is Germans. Does that answer your question? Yes, well, we're going to take our final question, but I do just uh, want to mention um, that there are some uh, Roebling 
uh, artifacts, I think is the best word, maybe just try them here. And uh, I know there's a, a member of our audience has brought them and I do want to just mention that. So people are welcome to have a look at those at the end of the evening. And there is a gentleman over there. So thank you. There is some genuine Roebling wire rope, I believe, on a, on a genuine Roebling spool. So I have the last question. I'm interested in- um, Don't mess it up. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll just ask a question and you take it. <laughs> Uh, about Roebling as an industrialist. Mm -hmm. uh, how many people work for him? What was his reputation like as a uh, owner of manufacturing plants? And did he uh, take out, was he an inventor of, you know, taking patents out on, on the wire rope and things of that magnitude? He did. Um, I will say I am not, so there are people who know way much more than this, than me about this subject. Uh, and, and one of the things that he's very famous because his name's on the company. John A. Roebling's and Sons Wire Rope became an industrial behemoth in the 20th century uh, in the Ro company town of Roebling and in Trenton. Um, and, uh, but it was a sort of smallish concern uh, that he built. He did not invent wire rope, but he sort of perfected certain versions of it. And he invented the wire rope industry. So he helped, he helped um, established wire rope as a sort of alternative to hemp rope in all sorts of different ways. Um, and he had quite a nice business going uh, and it started out in his back garden in, in Saxonburg. He moved it to Trenton in 1848 um, and it was, a, it was a good business. Um, and he employed, um, you know, probably 100, 200 people in his factory. He was well regarded um, during the financial panic of 1950, when was the financial panic? 1950. Well, I know there's one in the 50s. I'm trying to think. Ah. Um, but there was a financial panic in the US in 1857. Uh, um, and all his orders dried out. Uh, and he has all these instructions to his, um, his sort of right-hand man, Charles Swan, keep the laborers, like let's, let's try and work things out so we don't have to fire people. Uh, and so he was very keen on having a sort of permanent, long standing labor force. Um, but it was, it was a sort of 19th century business. It's when he dies and things like elevators and cable cars take off that his sons, his sons are really the powerhouse behind that. Um, I think Charles becomes the sort of Chief Operating Officer and Washington is in charge of um, uh, the sort of technical development of things. Um, and that, that becomes like, I mean, the principal employer in Trenton uh, for much of the 20th century and supplying wire ropes for ev almost every suspension bridge built in the US. Apply, you know, any, you, you have no skyscrapers without elevators uh, and they all need wire as well. Cable car systems, derricks, all these sort of things, uh, rigging in ships, all that comes out of wire rope. Um, so he he creates a, a, a an industry, uh, a business that's really bringing in a lot of money. And then when his sons take over, it explodes uh, with sort of the modernization of the country. Uh, the more wire rope comes to be used. Does that, does that help answer your question? Okay. Uh, but I will say part of I. I, I was saying this to a couple of people before the, the, um, the talk began. It's so easy to go down the Roebling rabbit hole on this. So I sort of purposely got to, and I spent so long just getting to the end of his life, I didn't want to then pursue it into what happened after he died to all of the various things, because uh, I thought I would probably go nuts doing that. So, and I was, and my final comment on John Roebling is I was happy to get this book done, but I actually never got bored of him. Um, I, I researched him and, and read about him, you know, all the time for 15 years, a little bit less than 15 years. And I always found something new about him that was like was interesting that I liked. But I also then when he died, I didn't want to go into his sons and start doing them as well. And I leave that. I can walk away now. Book number two. Oh, no, 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 no. Something, um, something completely different. Uh, Richard, um, I guess. Uh, we are going to come up with say a few words to you if we can. Um, so we want to express our huge appreciation. I mean, Thank you. 
that you highlighted so vividly the creativity um, of this multi-dimensional man who's so talented in so many directions. And, and I so, think- And so weird. And so weird, and, yeah, so, and weird. so weird, and so weird. But I think you also communicated your affection for him. And I think we, uh, you know, so we, we, I think we all have a different impression of Roebling now. So Good. Richard, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. I of course want to mention that it is possible to obtain a copy of this signed wonderful book signed, signed by the author signed. this evening. So Richard, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, before we uh, uh, invite you to have a glass of wine, um, our executive director, Victoria Dingle, would just like to say a few words. So I love the way Karen always hands me the mic after taking every word from the possible vocabulary and then saying she's going to say something with, with not a lot left to say, because I, I agree with everything that Karen says. And, and thank you for really bringing uh, John Roebling back to life. I can't imagine that it's been so long since someone wrote a book about him, but it yeah. may, I have to tell you, and you did a beautiful job and it's lived in you. You were obviously born to write the book. So, um, so he's shining down from above. But when I listen to these biographies, once again, I think, you know, how lucky we are for what we've been given by the great minds that have come before us that created great structures, buildings, where would we be without them? I spend more time thinking about where we'd be without them. And the intelligence, the creativity, the curiosity, the grit, the determination, the persistence, and all the things that can exist in each one of us today to create great things. So I often, uh, I sat in your lecture thinking how wonderful it would be if people thought what could be instead of thinking, you know, kind of letting themselves off the hook for producing. So yeah. here's to hard work, um, personal responsibility, and uh, just a good work ethic. It, it drives your entire life. So thank you for making me think about that. Thank you. Thank so, you. Thank you. And I just want to say one thing about our audience. Well, I'm just going to say I'm so happy to see our construction project management students with us tonight, our second year construction project management students who will work, continue to work to build our great city. So I'm happy that they're here with us tonight. And thank you to everyone who came out. Well, thank you to our friends online, but to the people who are here tonight in person. I love seeing your faces. So thank you for being here and taking the time to join us. Thank you. Um, we are truly going to let you go in one second, but Richard, we would like you to have a little thank memento you. of tonight. Oh, and I hope you saw your window display outside. And and I just also want to mention that two art lectures coming up in uh, uh, October, also known as Archtober, The Woman Who Changed Architect. That's on Tuesday, uh, um, October 18th, and that's a panel discussion. And uh, New Art Deco, New York Art Deco, Birds, Beast and Blooms, that's on Tuesday, October 25th. Um, thank you to our on online audience and to our in-person audience. I do hope you will join us for a glass of wine while you purchase a church book. Thank you. <laughs> Buy the book. Buy the book.